Hello, everybody. We're uh, now up to session 2.3, and I've put Niels Perling from uh, New York in one of the videos, and of course, <laughs> Alex Huber, who is the, the major player in the whole uh, session, and we will go to the session view in a minute. I need to, of course, emphasize uh, these nice videos. I mean, many videos we've done it all together, but the last video that you just saw it's all uh, due to, uh, or we have to thank, uh, or not maybe not, uh, uh, Robert Vincent, who, who spent his whole weekend, uh, this weekend, making these videos. <laughs> all right, uh, the floor is yours. I'm part of the panel, but I'll be quiet until spoken to. All right, thank you so much for introduction. I, I take over here. I, I don't think that I need to introduce um, uh, the panel, the distinguished panel that has been wonderfully done um, before in this um, in this nice video. And uh, Robert, again, thank you very much for, for doing that. That's quite impressive. And um, maybe a quick note on um, what's going on during uh, that session, which is obviously on revision AP surgery. Um, so we have in total 90 minutes time. And uh, we will start with, uh, with the video presentation from uh, um, Daniel, um, who uh, from sorry from Robert, who will um, give us a, a, a nice video presentation, and um, then we have about forty minutes to discuss, and um, at the end um, we will have uh, we will be open to the to the panel to the chat room, and we'll answer questions from the panel. Okay. okay, we're going now go to the video. Please mute your microphone, yeah, we'll except go, we'll Robert. Go. Hold on. Yes. I, I, I was got a message from Daniele, Daniele Marchioni, who said he's online, but he cannot see his screen. So maybe you can help. We'll uh, yes, of course. <laughs> um, let me check. Do you want yeah, me so to do uh, it live? <laughs> Yeah, right. might, I just, uh, might I just say as well, on the timing, we've really got about 30, 35 minutes for the panel because we really do want to involve the best part of an hour for the Zoom room. Yeah. So, and, and Manesh is ready that for Dwayne, and uh, they're ready, I think. Uh, I will uh, try to uh, tell... Um, well, anyway, uh, Robert, your video. I'll, I'll see if I can sort it out, okay? I'm trying okay. to get okay. uh, Let's do that. our Italian Let's do friend that. in, okay? Yeah. So I'm just uh, starting with the presentation of the uh, surgical technique for revision uh, stapy surgery. So we're going to talk about all these different situations. So the first one will be, of course, a case of short procedure. I tried to give an overview of the techniques we're using according Robert, to surgical Can we just get that full screen, Wilco? I'm not, uh, I'm not hosting, but we need to get the video full oh, screen okay. we can, on the we Zoom room. Uh, come back to the beginning. Because at the moment, we've just got Robert on the Zoom room. Manesh, you, you, you need to, I you need to control that. The beginning. Do you want it? I do, uh, but I need to be host to control it. I'm not hosting at the moment. If you make me co-host, I'll do it. Manesh, are you going to take control? Uh, okay, or it's, I it's, will fine right. it's fine now. It's fine now. Is it okay? No, it was for a second. Can I, can I start again? or? Yeah, yes, we will get on, you starting on. again. But Do you want to make me co-host and I can do that? Let me check, Chris. I'm working on it. Okay. What about now? Is it okay? Yes, okay. No, okay. It's back okay to, now. It's good now. It's the good it now. is to the big beginning. Okay, Manesh, are you going okay, to do Robert. it? Because then I can remove Chris. Yes, that's fine. Hello, Roger. Bonjour. I just left. Okay. <laughs> So we start again. So it's, a, it's an overview of the surgical technique we can use, and, and it's more interesting to illustrate the condition that we find. Uh, one of the easy one is what we find a short prosthesis, or when the previous uh, surgery has not been over. If you can see here, that's what I said. That's what I would have liked to see with a nice uh, 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 um, exposure, which is not good enough for me. And this is the reason why it failed, I think, because as you will see, the that was not good. So I am just enlarging now the exposure in order to check the position of the previous prosthesis. Whatever we do, I think it's always very important that we have a clear exposure to understand why it failed. So in this case, I'm checking malice and kiss mobility to rule out any malice and kilosis. And as you can see, I'm pushing the procedures and there is resistance. 
which means that it seems that the shaft is not correctly positioned, placed. So I'm removing the, the prosthesis now, I'm measuring, and in fact, I found that it was not the short prosthesis, but the previous surgeon did not perform a stapedotomy. So we, uh, we discover uh, a clear uh, fixed foot plate. So in that case, of course, it's becoming just like a primary case, performing an, a, a real stapedotomy followed by vein graft interposition and the reconstruction with the prosthesis. Uh, so I'm cutting the prosthesis in the same way as I presented this morning during the first uh, panel on primary stapes, and then I will put the, the prosthesis in the same way. So in that case, the cause of failure was a previous prosthesis, the previous technique, which was not correctly done with a, a, a foot plate, which was intact. So I would say to avoid that, I, I think it is important to measure clearly the distance from the incus to the foot plate. And I'm using the mid surface of the incus here. It's 4.5 millimeter. You can see the, the upper uh, one is in front of the incus. And the second trick is to be sure that the shaft is correctly uh, located inside the state economy. Once you're finished, we're looking for the piston. The piston should bend but not move. But in this case, you can see it's moving away from the other window. So definitely, in this case, the shaft has been cut too shortly. So I had to revise myself. And the same, of course, I had to remove the process I put before. And I put a longer one. I made a mistake in measuring. And you will see the difference. I will use can everybody except time. Robert close their microphones please all right so you can see that now the shaft is bending well and now the second uh, case would be a dislocated prosthesis uh, again that's another situation where the previous surgeon didn't do a clear exposure you can see I have to remove this bone this should have been done during the pre previous uh, surgery so we're going to remove that and then I remove the prosthesis to have a clear exposure and now we need to identify what was the cause of problem here. So the process was completely dislocated from the incus. And again, we find a, a, a normal incus there. But in that case, I need to refenestrate the labyrinth because you see there is some fibrous tissue covering the other window and I cannot place the shaft over it. I need to recreate the fenestra, both with the laser and the micro drill. Um, and it's nice to have a laser in that case when you've got a fibrous tissue like this. And of course, at the end, I will finalize the state dotomy with the micro drill. And this will be followed by the same type of technique with uh, vein graft interposition and then the prosthesis. But one, the point is that in, in, in my experience, I always prefer to refenestrate the labyrinth. And then I measure, you can see that I'm measuring only at the end here because the fibrous tissue was pretty thick. Uh, finalizing the stapedotomy using uh, a 0.7 micro uh, diamond dust spur. Now this is again the vein graft interposition with the intima facing the surgeon now. And I will now cut the process at the corresponding length. The shaft is introduced again within the stapedotomy and then the loop will be crimped around the incus. So that was uh, another easy case, I would say, of uh, cause of failure to treat. Uh, because the incus is intact and definitely, of course, the success rate when you do revision status operations when you have a regular, a normal incus. So what should we do to avoid prosthesis dislocation depending on the prosthesis you use? But if we use uh, a Teflon prosthesis like this, we need to ensure uh, to cream clearly uh, the loop around the incus and not to believe too much about the uh, uh, the um, uh, the fact that the, there's a memory with the Teflon. We should help the memory by crimping more accurately the loop like this, or with the curved forceps. I use different tricks, uh, the two hooks of the curved forceps, that, that we're following the same rule, trying to crimp the loop around the incus. Uh, another cause of failure would be, of course, the problem of over window re -obliteration. So in that case, I would use the same technique as I explained and shown this morning, we need to recreate a fenestra, which is more tricky there, uh, because we, I, I like not to drill out directly uh, a state pedotomy, but just enlarging the drilling to have a better exposure of the entire foot plate. So I'm doing this, you can see that I'm just leaving the diamond does doing the job by itself without any pressure, just to avoid any dislocation of a whole foot plate. 
until I reach the blue line. So it's a combination of uh, drilling out and laser sometimes, but not in case of obliteration because the laser is not that efficient in, 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 this, in this type of situation. So we're now creating the fenestra in the same way at the end. And I will use again a vein graft and the prosthesis. In that case, I used a bucket prosthesis because the incus was uh, pretty short. So I like to use this prosthesis in that case, which goes underneath the lenticular process. So I'm, this is made in Teflon, same as a regular piston with a 0.4 millimeter diameter. So I'm just elevating a little bit the incus at the same time, and then uh, uh, introducing the hollow head underneath the lenticular process like this. It's, it's a very nice uh, uh, type of prosthesis. Uh, so here we, we've got a final result, the final aspect for stop and looking for the bending sign again as usual. Another cause of failure, classical one, is the case of eroded incus. So I will go for malleus to stapedotomy procedure. In that case, you see I try to identify and you can see the cause of failure and you can see that the distal tip of the incus is eroded. I'm sure that some surgeon like Duane will use a semen, a semen in this case, but I prefer to use a torp. So I will do a malice relocation, of course, in this case, uh, dissecting entirely uh, the malice from the tympanic membrane, including, as I said, the neck of the malice like this, removing now the incus, and then relocating the malice. So again, cutting the tensor tympanite tendon, and then using a hook to pull uh, the malice backwards until we reach the resistance of the anterior tympanomalia ligament, and then overstretching the ligament to be able to place the malice over the stapes foot plate. You notice that I'm sticking back the malice to the tympanic membrane prior measuring, because I want to be sure that I'm measuring from the correct position of, of the malice. And then of course, we need again to recreate the fenestra, again with a combination of laser uh, and the micro drill. So we, I'm always following the same type of technique as I shown. And then again, um, Measuring with, uh, this is an elongated stapes measuring rod. The basic one runs from 3.5 to 4.5. This one runs from 5 to 8 millimeter. And that is the procedure I use uh, with a Teflon shaft, a 0.4 millimeter diameter. The shaft is first introduced within the stapedotomy, which is covered by the vein. And then you can see I'm going to introduce very easily now the Mali sandal within the groove because the malice has been uh, relocated completely. And I'm looking for a final vertical position of the torque like this. And they are fitting well together. As you can see, looking for the round window. Um, another trick will be to use the malice, total malice piston, which, uh, so I make a gap between the malice and the tympanic membrane. And I'm crimping the loop around the incus like this. I don't like too much this uh, kind of technique because I've been, using that in, in many cases, but I've, I've seen cases of uh, reaction of the tympanic membrane with the Teflon, which is not sometimes very well tolerated. So I prefer to use a tort. The other case is a, a malleus ankylosis like this. It's important to make a diagnosis of the cause of failure again. So definitely here, the process seems to be fine, but the malleus is fixed. And in that case, if you ask the patient, in many cases, you can see that the patient is going to say it's an, it was an immediate failure. There was no improvement for in the previous surgery. Uh, so of course I would do the same, uh, again, the malice relocation technique, uh, pulling back the malice backwards. And by doing this, you change completely the position of the, of the malice head, decreasing the risk of uh, recurrent malice ankylosis. Now I need again to recreate the fenestra, uh, both the use of laser or micro drill again, the same, same thing. And this will be again uh, followed by the same technique uh, using the same technique of vein graft into position and torque. As we said before, I think if you use a torque, using something to cover the oval window is nearly mandatory in my, in, my, in my mind. So I would put the process like this, because of course, if you don't put anything to protect, then there's a risk of protrusion of the torque within the labyrinth. And again, round window uh, side. So to avoid this kind of situation, I think it is important in my mind to separate the incus from the stapes first prior uh, checking the ossicle chain mobility. So then you can definitely rule out any uh, problem of malus ankylosis. Otherwise, if you do not separate the joint, that's what I believe, you cannot sometimes make the difference between malus ankylosis and stapes ankylosis. 
So it's better to separate the joint first. And you can see, of course, the difference there. Um, so I, I use a joint knife to do this. So you see here, I'm checking malleus increased mobility and stapes mobility. And stapes is uh, fixed at the same time and uh, malleus was, was uh, fine. Now the last one is the fistula. That was an interesting case. We need to identify definitely anatomically, I mean the fistula, because we did that uh, clinically with the fistula sign, but we need to definitely expose the other window, uh, expose definitely the fistula itself. In, in this case, you can see there is a fluid leakage. There was no interposition. So I just want to be sure that I will expose everything. We, we got a floating full plate also. That's quite a tricky case but I just want to expose the whole thing to cover it widely with a vein graft. If we do not expose the fistula, there's a risk of leaving the fistula there. So I, I like to expose completely the, the, the fistula before uh, placing the vein graft like this. So I take a little bit of time to, to stretch the vein and then placing a, 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 a prosthesis at the end. And it's sometimes tricky because I, I've got cases where uh, there is a fistula definitely with a clear fistula sign, truly a phenomenon sometimes, but, but with a normal hearing. So it's tricky to make a decision to revive, but we have to do it. Okay, that's what I want to show you. Oh, uh, uh, Alex, we, we can't hear you. Sorry, I muted the microphone. So, um, <laughs> sorry, um, I was I was saying thank you for this wonderful video presentation and congratulations to uh, to this uh, really um, great recordings and um, teaching that you did. Uh, very interesting cases also, and I suggest we have um, only about ten minutes before we open to the the chat room. Uh, um, I. I saw in the first um, in the first video you mentioned a very important thing that is that you need good exposure to um, uh, to 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 really see what the problem is. Of course, that's that's more than correct. And can you tell the audience what what are your landmarks that you want to see um, when when you do the posterior canal plasty? Yeah, I like to see two things: the fascia nerve and the pyramidal process of, of the stapes tendon. Yes, and that with that, the, typically you can you can have a good um, you can make good decisions about the surgery. I agree completely. So, um, Neil, are you are you using um, a curette as well? Or are you um, are you using a, uh, a drill to do that? Well, actually, I use a curette. Uh, although my curettes are not quite as sharp as as Robert's, so uh, it takes a little bit more elbow uh, grease, as they say. Uh, I think exposure is is really key, and I think uh, I'm sure the discussion will come up about using endoscopes, uh, which I do not use routinely. But it's the exposure that is what people are after when they're when they're using the endoscope, and I think Robert's uh, demonstration was amazing because the the uh, exposure was really beautiful. Anybody in the panel uses a drill to do that, and uh, um, can we discuss the advantages and disadvantages? Nobody. So, uh, Alex, are you John, referring to the bo to the bony rim, or are you referring to the to the bony rim? Yeah, the posterior oh, yeah, okay. canal. Okay. The, yeah. No, not. Are you Chis using chisel or you... correct? Yeah. Chisel or correct? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I certainly do the same as Neil. I uh, I use a curette as much as possible. Um, you have to remember that the British curettes, although they're made in the UK, a lot of them are not as sharp as uh, the French curettes, and uh, you do have to really strengthen up your Seen her eminence. Just because, uh, just because the very controlled of instrument. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree. So um, the uh, the disadvantage, one of the disadvantages of the drill is certainly that uh, that you need to open a, another instrument, which uh, which makes the whole preparation time a little bit longer. Do you see any other disadvantages of the of the drill? Not at the moment. You know, one disadvantage, which I'd be curious to know what the panel feels, is um, if there's a lot of bone debris generated by a, a drill while you're drilling in the ear canal, I think there's some risk to that, uh, to the vestibular fluids, if the do bone debris does find its way down. I'm just curious if anyone else has that concern, but uh, that is one of my concerns. 
I certainly agree with that, That's Neil. It. I think the other, the other thing is that however careful you are, if there's still a corder there and you're drilling, you are potentially putting that at risk as well. Uh, the curette's an incredibly accurate instrument when you've had adequate practice with it. But it's not the instrument to use the first time you do an ear operation. You really need to strengthen up your hands um, as it can be. The bone can be very resistant, and resilient. Um, I agree with that. You, you know, when, when, when Wilco, Wilco has a nice way to, uh, to uh, use the, the chisels to do it, better than what I do. Because uh, I've done it more often, I suppose. Um, it was born out of necessity because of uh, the lack of sharp instruments. I mean, if you if you share your your OR with many people, and there, I mean, if if the nurses stand with the neurosurgeon and do brain surgery, they're not that interested in staper surgery. And it's very but, difficult to get dedicated personnel like Robert. I mean, Robert has the best nurse in the, the south of France and probably in Europe to have people dedicated and, and keep the instrument sharp, then a chisel works fine because nobody dares to use it. So I'm always happy using, being the only one using the chisel. Huh? But you know, uh, the other thing is you, you never, give, never give a sharp yeah. instrument to a Dutchman. Uh, John, you were mentioning the sharpness of the Tourette. This is the reason, uh, for the French one, this is the reason why, why Wilco is going to join the cost clinic soon, because he wants to get the sharp instrument. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be secret, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I think the, I think it's a really important point. We're joking about it, but I, I don't know whether any of you know what happens at the Cost Clinic. Um, the Cost Clinic is owned by a man who's also an engineer, and he's actually built the preparation facility for the cleaning of the instruments next to the theatre, so the surgeons can watch their instruments being cleaned and prepared. The rest of us send our instruments away to some nebulous place miles yeah. away, to somebody who's not paid very much, who doesn't comprehend what they're being used for. And that makes a huge difference. John, Hello? can we go back to the, to the chair? I, I, I want to say Alec. to, sorry, sorry, I want to say hi yeah. to Daniela, because Daniela now joined us via Zoom. I can see him. And, thank uh, you. No, thank you. Oh, uh, grazie per uh, venire con noi. Hello, let's move to um, to the second case, the re-obliteration. So, um, I noticed there was a, a complete obliteration and you used the drill and, and the laser both in combination. Um, so Daniele, I, I cannot see you. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Great. Yes. Can um, you are you using, yes. are you also using a laser for revision stapy surgery? Um, yeah, I think that the laser is uh, sometimes more safe, but of course, in the case of obliteration, ca uh, in obliteration uh, window, sometimes it's not so easy to work uh, with the laser, and I prefer to use the drill. One of the most important concepts in the obliteration of the, of, of course, of the oval window is uh, the place where you are able to drill because uh, uh, it's really important to stress the concept that more anterior you you are drilling and more close you are in the fundus of the internal auditory canal. So uh, my idea is to remove uh, with the drill all the obliteration on the bone and maintaining my position more just a little bit in the middle of the foot plate or just a little bit more posterior. I don't know if you agree with this concept. Absolutely. Any any other ideas about it? I noticed that um, uh, Robert did like a funnel shaped um, uh, perforation or a, a funnel into, into the obliteration and um, uh, used the laser at the beginning to probably uh, um, uh, to not have any bleeding and then again when he saw the, the blue line. Is that is that correct, Robert? Exactly. In fact, the, the, the laser itself doesn't work very well in terms of uh, when, when we have obliterative uh, foot plate, but it helps to decrease the bleeding because sometimes it bleeds much more in this type of situation. I think, Alex, it's, it's a question of a, a sequential use. If the laser will work, um, you can certainly use it to, uh, uh, to prevent 
perform the initial vaporization, then a little bit of drilling, then a bit of laser. What you're actually trying to do and what Robert, I think, was demonstrating was opening out most of the oval fossa area rather than a, a funnel. So he got a flat surface to work with. But if you're going to use a laser like that, you need to make sure you have a, a few seconds in between using it to allow for cooling. Yes, I, I, I think it is important to have a funnel-like shape because um, of the angulation of the prosthesis. So if you have a very thin footplate, as we have typically in a primary case, um, uh, then it's not so important uh, what the angulation is. But if it's a very um, uh, obliterated um, oval window, then uh, if, the, if the angle is not, is not very straight, uh, then it's easy for the prosthesis to catch and um, to be impeded so then the, the sound transmission is not as good. Any thoughts of, to that? So um, um, let's let's move to uh, to another um, another topic. Um, you showed the eroded incus, and um, you had a, a bucket prosthesis in this case. What um, what is your decision making between the the bucket and uh, the typical Teflon prosthesis? Usually, is the other uh, in other cases. Yeah, I was showing this bucket not for the eroded incus, for the, I think it was a reobliteration. Oh, remember. sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, there was for question the question is fine. I, yeah. I understand. Uh, I use the bucket prosthesis when I have a decent facial nerve or short incus, because if you if you have an incus like this, and if the facial nerve is there, then if you put the a loop there, then the shaft will be in contact with the facial nerve, which I don't think is a real issue, but I would prefer avoiding that. But, but And that putting a bucket prosthesis goes which goes underneath the lenticular process, you get a, a larger gap with, uh, compared to the facial nerve. So I think it's safe. John, you're using a uh, Teflon prosthesis? Yeah, I'm using a very, well, I, I, I use Robert's technique, basically. You know, we've been friends for many years. And uh, I've moved over more recently to using the bucket um, much more frequently. I do like to have the prosthesis vertical. Um, and what Robert says is very important. If there's a short, long process of incus, the bucket handle then sits uh, in a vertical opposition. But it does require a slightly more sophisticated technique um, to get it into place. Putting a loop on is relatively easy, but um, putting the bucket handle underneath is like the old trick of patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. You have to be lifting the long process of the incus while you're moving the bucket handle underneath without perforating into the uh, the perilymph so it, it's an acquired technique but I think it's a great you prosthesis know, what I don't know I don't know whether you get less necrosis with a bucket handle uh, and we're talking you know, about revision I'm using I'm, uh, sorry John um, I do use uh, I use a bucket handle for almost all of my cases primary and revision uh, there is a little bit of a learning curve but not much I think it's not that hard to do uh, the, the standard bucket handle, unfortunately, has a sort of a, a, an axis that uh, when you fit it on the lenticular process, it's fit in a very specific um, angle to the incus, which is sometimes good, but not always good. Which is the reason why I've actually recently switched to something called a Bartels bucket, which is a bucket handle which um, actually is crimpable. It's quite an interesting um, prosthesis. I find it useful both in revisions as well as primary cases because it adapts to the, to the shape of the distal incus. Whether it's eroded or not, you can use it. Uh, and it can be crimped into place. And so I don't know if it's possible, Wilco, for you to run that video, but it, uh, I do have a short video about that prosthesis. Uh, I would have to ask the, the chair if he agrees uh, if you intervene with uh, all kinds of videos. Alex, um, can we? That, that, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Oh, it's a very short video, isn't it? D don't be so generous. Okay, here it is. <laughs> This is an eroded incus, as you can see, it's a short incus. Unlike the standard bucket, it has these tongs that can be crimped into place. Is titanium MRI safe and all the rest of it? Yeah, titanium. 
is it easy to place the the handle under the under the the cord? I I notice it's quite a long handle. It is a long handle. Yeah. We, I it, mean, we finished. all we all we all use the handle, but in in reality, I I suspect the handle does very little. Um, it's it's the actual interposition of the prosthesis that holds it in place. Uh, the hand within a few I days agree. there'll be loose connective tissue holding it. There's one point I agree with you, John. There's one point that it needs to be uh, pointed out. In fact, when you measure the distance from the incus to the foot plate, if we use a, a regular piston, then we cut it at the corresponding length. So if we measure 4.5, I will cut it at 4.5. But if we use the bucket, you need to remove a little bit because of the of the thickness of the lenticular process. And in my experience, I remove 0.5. So if I measure 4.5, if I want to use the bucket, I will cut it at 4. Uh, sorry, but just uh, um, a question. Another issue is this. In, in erosion of the incus, it's really important to understand the, the condition of the incus. So if you have a, a good uh, incudomalleolar join, sometimes you can use a bony cement. Do you have some experience about the bony cement on the long process of the incus? Because in my hand, Sometimes it's working in a good way, but uh, I would like to know your experience about this. I don't have it, but I think, Dwayne, you have experience with that, I'm sure. Yes, I, I have to agree with Daniel there. I would, in most of my revisions, bring cement into the game. Obviously, depending on what it is, if it's a reobliteration, no, that won't work. But if it's anything eroded from the lenticular process or, or something you know, on the incus, then uh, the cement, the ossicular cement works very, very well. It's safe, and uh, we've had very nice results with that. So... That, that's what I would use in this situation. Can I pass in the comments, Dr. Alex? Yes, of course. Can I, can I give a Yes. Well, I have to agree with Duane here because I have done about uh, uh, eight or ten cases, revision cases, and I read a lot of literature. Now, what they suggest is that your bone cement is not really to uh, remake or refashion the incus. It is mainly to keep the piston in place with a block behind it so that it doesn't slip out. So that is the only way. But the fear of bone cement, they feel, is that in years to come, due to the continuous vibrations of the ossicular chain, they don't know how far it might really uh, stay in place. So the only other option for that is maybe a torp or a, a bucket prosthesis. But bone cement for primary, yes, it works, I think. Or using the technique that um, Robert is using, or using a malleostapedotomy would also be an, another another possibility. Um, what is used in in the Netherlands? <laughs> that I want to know. I can only tell you what, what I would use. <laughs> um, I would do a malleostapedotomy, uh, but I would first try to do an Awengen piston, which will allow you to. Uh, fit snug without any, uh, actually on a very uh, thin incus, uh, eroded incus, uh, a malleus or an, um, an a, a wangen piston would still crimp tightly. And I've used that a couple of times with good success actually. And with a very small stump laying over the facial nerve, it still would work pretty well. But uh, I, I know, I mean, uh, I don't think it's a very popular prosthesis and it's, it can be challenging to get it on, but it works fine. Excellent. So um, the uh, the time is already um, um, uh, quite quite far. Shall we ask for a question in the in the chat room, or sh what what do you think, John? Oh, I, 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 abso absolutely. I think we should get the chat room in as much as possible. This is what it's all about. Um, you know, we, so we talk Manesh, highfalutin you. things. We want simple answers. Yeah. There are a lot of questions, and what I can request, uh, Dr. Alex is that maybe we can go through those questions quickly so we can, you know, uh, cover a wider topic for everybody. Uh, yes, now a few questions here is that the anesthesia, now there are many of them prefer to do uh, the stapy surgery under local anesthesia, some general anesthesia. So is it true that for a revision stapy surgery, would you like to do it under general local anesthesia, mainly to know the vestibular stimulation and the hearing improvement on table? What's the view of the panelists? Who wants to start? Um, Robert, do you want to uh, give an answer on that? Yeah, I do. I do general all the time. Uh, I prefer to have a very stable patient, not moving, especially when we do uh, a stapedotomy. 
So I think it's I think it's important for me. Uh, I don't yeah, see any. I agree with that. Oh, yeah, obviously, John, you always agree. You're such a nice man. No, I don't. No, I don't. I, I was going to make a point. You go first, Wilke. Okay. Uh, you go first. Yeah, I, I, I would not see any advantage of uh, seeing or ha getting direct feedback from the patient if he's not under uh, narcosis. And to be honestly uh, honest, I think we see many people that perform on the local, but in many cases they're so sedated that it's almost semi-narcosis without intubation. So how do you check function, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So I, I'm not convinced uh, that under local would help, and I think uh, you never know what what surprise you find with a uh, revision. So I definitely go for a um, general anesthesia, and I have to if I go to work in France, but it's my procedure anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mine are uh, all done under yeah, a lar laryngeal mask. Um, I do a laryngeal mask so that they don't have any coughing when they wake up. They're all done under hypotension. And for American ASA 1 and 2, we'll take the uh, systolic down to the resting diastolic. So quite low, maybe 60 systolic or 80 systolic during anesthesia. Uh, John, I have to mute you if you talk about these uh, pressures. Yeah, can sorry. I <laughs> Can I ask one thing to Daniel, because Daniel is doing a lot of endoscopic stapy surgery. Does this change something in terms of uh, anesthesia? No, I, I agree with you. Only in general anesthesia, because uh, the surgeon must be calm and performing in a right way, especially during uh, uh, revision surgery. Uh, you can have some uh, vertigo in patients or you can have some movement is not right and instead if you are working in general you, of course uh, the situation is completely different for the surgeon it is not a problem to put the prosthesis in the right place because you can see in a better way and uh, you can manage in a right way and so i think that the general anesthesia is the best so maybe just from the panel, uh, from the Zoom room, the, we did a little poll and uh, we just asked, actually referring to the primary surgery, who would do it under local anesthesia and who would do it under general anesthesia. And uh, we got a 35% from the Zoom room would do the stapedotomy under local anesthesia and 69 under general anesthesia. So just uh, that, that poll came back there. Dwayne, um, interesting figures, but what is local anesthesia and what's the preparation of the local anesthesia? I'm sure you didn't ask that, but... Uh, <laughs> No, what would you advise? We didn't ask that. So I actually do, I agree with Robert I, and, and with Danielle. I do everything under general anesthesia unless there's a very, for some reason, there's a reason a patient cannot have a general anesthetic. Um, so for local anesthesia, um, well, we actually pack the ear canal with something called Emla cream. Uh, we do that half an hour before the time, and then we would place a uh, local um, lidocaine, normally with adrenaline injection, into the ear canal skin and then proceed for, forward from there. That, that would be our, present, uh, our sort of preparation for a local anesthesia. That's great. Uh, there, there is another question from the Zoom room here. Uh, how much would you depend on a CT scan while doing a revision TP surgery? Now, so that's a very good question. So um, a, a general question actually, should we perform a CT scan before we do a revision AP surgery, and um, uh, then maybe we can we can answer this question first. Who is uh, who is doing a, a CT scan before um, before we do, uh, you do a revision? Hands maybe. Everybody. Yes, and how much? Excellent. How much would they do? It's also important, I think. Yeah. It, so it might the question is, what do, we see, what do we see in the CT? It might depend on whether it's your revision of one of your failures or somebody else's revision. I, for definite, if somebody else had done it, I would do a CT. I think if I'd done it myself and I'd already seen the middle ear and seen the structures, the facial nerve and everything else, I might consider not doing a CT. That's a it's very becoming medical point. Legally, yeah, It's I becoming don't... medically legally important. No, but it's very interesting because I think and Robert has shown, I mean, we've, we've done work together on that. I mean, the time of failure is very important. If you have a failure, say, a week after your, your surgery, 
then uh, of course, I, and there is no central neural hearing loss, then a dislodgement of the procedures becomes very likely. If the long-term failure, failure, there can be anything uh, happening. I mean, we, one week is of course exaggerated, say a month or two months after. Uh, if it's much longer than adhesions, etc., cetera, is, uh, can be the case. And I think for counseling of the patient, I think the CT scan is essential. And uh, John, uh, of course, this is a joke, but if I had a patient of you, I would do the MRI as well. <laughs> So, um, you know, you know uh, another, another issue, issue. medical legal necessity, yeah. yeah You're absolutely particularly right. When, uh, when we talk about superior semicircular canal dehiscence, so, um, so I think it's, it's quite important that, uh, that we do a CT scan at some point um, if we have uh, unclear revision. Yes. Well, well one question from Kranti Bhavna from uh, Mumbai is that whenever you're doing a revision case for a reobliteration, is it very, very important to have a widely opened uh, uh, oval window or can we still make it just the same measurement as what was there in like a primary case? Can I say, can I reply to that? Yes. Sure. Well, I, I, I prefer to enlarge the drilling because if you, I think it, I think it helps to decrease the risk of reobliteration. Because if you have a reobliteration following the first surgery, there is a higher risk to see a, a new reobliteration following the revision. So I prefer to enlarge the drilling in order to have a flat and thin footplate prior performing a stapedotomy. Robert, you blue line it almost, don't you? Yes, I saw. Yeah, yeah, blue line. I'm looking for the blue line. Yes. Does anyone else have any other opinion, Dr. Alex? Yourself. So I think it's I think it's very important that um, if you if you consider the um, the perforation and the and the prosthesis being in a not perfect angle, if it's a very thin full plate, then um, it doesn't make a difference. But if it's a very long um, funnel or, or a, a long tunnel that you drill, then suddenly it becomes very important that uh, the prosthesis is not catching at the edges catching and um, the impeding edges. the... Um, Does anyone else in the panel? I think I, I agree point, with I uh, Robert. Uh, you, you need to drill uh, in a large way uh, the oval window in order to avoid the reobliteration because sometimes it's really challenging to perform this surgery and when you are drilling in in just with a hole sometimes you can lose your anatomical landmark the first and the second you can have a reobliteration so it's really important to perform a drilling a wide drilling like this yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the point of flattening out the foot plate is important, particularly if you use interposed material, a vein graft like us. If you just drill a channel through a, a thickened foot plate, you end up with a great big chunk of vein that's like a closed umbrella, um, which is no good to man the beast. It needs to be flat, otherwise you, it causes If you use problems. a vein graft. If you use a vein graft. If you use a vein. <coughs> only, if you, only if you use a vein, yeah. To, to be honest, uh, from my experience, I think 80% of the revisions that you do from elsewhere, I think exposure must have been one of the major issues why the, uh, there was a failure. I see frequently that the exposure of the previous surgeon can never have been sufficient, at least to my standards and to Rob Robert's standards, because I mean, Robert makes a very nice exposure. Uh, and I think that would be, that could explain uh, quite a bit of failures in, in actually a procedure that, that we should state is actually a, a one chance procedure. So if you look at the, the results, I mean, the, the truth, uh, if, if you're really caring about your patient, it needs to be a one chance procedure. The second, a revision surgeries have so much lower results. Yes, coming, coming also, to that, people uh, have yes, uh, just coming to the exposure part, there's uh, just an interesting point here, is that uh, the success rate of revision stapy surgery is maybe from 54 to 60% only compared to the primary surgery. So what do you think is the, the cause of the failure and uh, cause of the low success uh, rate? And uh, uh, what do you explain to the patient uh, when it comes to the consent in a revision surgery? Well, I'm, I'm happy to try and answer that. that. 
Sorry. Neil. Neil. Uh, no, I was going to say that uh, you know revision surgery can be such a huge variety of problems that you have to solve, and, and that's the problem is preoperatively and you're consenting a, a patient, you really don't know what you're going to find. In those cases, which is simple, which is the majority of the cases that the prosthesis is simply out of place, uh, you could sort of anticipate a good outcome. But there are certainly lots of things that could go wrong and things that you might not anticipate. And so when you're discussing it with patient, I think you you know you have to be able to discuss that and say that there is significant risk. Uh, but there's really it's really hard to predict exactly what you're going to find at the time of the surgery. Yeah, can I say something, Alex, about that? I I think it's true. But we published a paper with Wilco uh, presenting the the uh, big series of uh, more than one thousand cases of revision, and I was trying to to uh, correlate the timing of failure to the cause of failure, which I could identify preoperatively, which is also correlated to the success rate, because uh, depending on the situation, the success rate will not, will not be the same. What I mean is that we have, if we have an intact incus, it's not going to be the same as if we have an eroded incus. And it's interesting to discuss that point. Uh, when you ask the patient uh, about the timing of failure, definitely when we have a short failure or immediate failure, it's usually related to, to, I would say, easy cause of uh, failure to treat with, uh, including uh, intact foot plate or uh, aborted surgery or uh, dislocated uh, uh, loop, which was not correctly placed. Uh, surgical er has, surgical uh, errors, really. When, 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 I has, when I have a long-term failure, uh, asking the patient, it's related more or less in many cases to eroded incus, which is more difficult to treat. So in other words, um, um, as I understand the panel, so the the um, the technique used needs to be adapted to the pathology, and um, the surgeon should uh, have a wide variety of um, possible techniques available to uh, to solve all the problems that should give the best results. Is that right? Can I have one more question yeah. from the Zoom room? Yeah, sure. Alex, I agree with, you, with your conclusion. Yes, Dr. Modi Grower, you asked that uh, a lot of cases after a stapy surgery uh, have a high frequency hearing loss and they come for sometimes a revision. So what do you do uh, in these cases and what is the reason for the high frequency loss? Um, well, the reason... I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I understand the... Sorry. Did you say something, Robert? Yeah, I think I, th I think the question was there, there was uh, in, in many cases we have a high frequency hearing loss prior uh, doing going to revision surgery, and the the question was yeah. So do what you mean, when when would you like to revise these cases in case you wish to? It's a high frequency conductive loss. If we have a high frequency conductive hearing loss only high frequency. Yes, that's right. Well, that, in that case, in many cases, in my experience, I've found dislocated incus. For high frequency. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, but Duane, do you have any experience of this? You can't use bone cement here. No, <laughs> no you can't use bone cement. So one thing that, that we do see, I, I've just found that if the, um, you know, sometimes when you do an osteoplasty and you do a revision and you find that they've got that high frequency loss and you go in, you can find that the joint is ankylosed. And I don't know if that really plays a role, how the joint, uh, you know, sort of adds to giving that high frequency loss. But I think it's got to do with the rocking effect of what we're replacing with a piston instead of the foot plate of the stapes. Uh, but I've, uh, I haven't got an answer for it. Sorry. Daniel, do you like so to one... add something to this? Yeah. Uh, my idea is uh, uh is to explain to the patient that also the revision surgery, because uh, uh, the topic is the revision surgery, uh, it's a really um, a difficult surgery. And especially uh, we should be honest with the patient because uh, we can have uh, also more in a more frequent way, a problem with the hearing function with the dead hear uh, between 1% of 2% of the cases in our casistic is of course, 
more dangerous with respect to the traditional surgery. So in my opinion, one of the most important aspects of the revision surgery is to explain to the patient that sometimes the patient can have not a good results in terms of hearing function. And also uh, there is more risk uh, regarding uh, the uh, neurosensorial hearing loss. I, I think that it's really important to, to, to express uh, ourselves with the patient in this way. What do we think? Yes. Yes, that's a fantastic answer. So what, Alex, you want to... One, oh, I agree. Ask. Yes, one, agree. one other possibility is that um, there are some cases where there is not a sensory neural high frequency hearing loss, but a real uh, conductive high frequency hearing loss. And that um, exists when there is a loose connection. Um, this is a, it comes in a trias with high frequency hearing loss, fluctuating hearing and um, responsiveness to Valsalva maneuver. And in those cases, um, the revision uh, results are typically quite good. Maybe at this stage, I can just bring one of the questions just from the Zoom room that's been asked. And that is, so if you go in and the piston is still in the fenestra, for example, in a rotus, rotted incus, how do you remove that piston safely? Now, we've seen in reverse case, he has a vein graft. But uh, maybe just, uh, they just want the panelists to give us some idea how they yeah, do, this, do that. This, this is probably one of the most dangerous situations. And it, sometimes I think it depends on the piston material. If it's Teflon, I, I certainly have a feeling that that is more easy to remove from a stapedotomy than uh, sometimes titanium. I, I definitely think you need to control the distal tip of the prosthesis with the, the laser on low power to remove any loose connective tissue to actually see what you're doing. I definitely think you shouldn't just pull a piston out. I, Robert might want to comment on that because he's uh, obviously got the figures. Yeah, that's right. That's true. It, it definitely depends on the type of uh, material. If it's a, a Teflon piston, it's, a, it's made in Teflon, you can remove it, I, I think, with that great risk unless you can identify the distal tip of the prosthesis prior to removing it. So I always try to use a laser to vaporize the fibrous tissue. Uh, but it's absolutely mandatory to do it like this if we have a wire prosthesis or titanium prosthesis because the risk of having uh, uh, adherence to the saccule is more important. So it's very tricky sometimes. We have another question from the Zoom room. Uh, would any of the panel use a bucket handle prosthesis without an interposition graft? You can. It's the no. same as a, any uh, a piston. You can use uh, anything without interposition. But the difficulty with a bucket is that you, you have this moment of where it's sort of free floating in the, uh, in the oval window. And so it, it is kind of nice to have that vein there. I always do it with the vein. Yeah. Yes, I well, I mean, like you know, I said, I said previously, I, you know, one of the reasons that I decided the vein was a good idea in my early days was just in case I did uh, drop a prosthesis. And certainly you have to have a vein if you're doing a, a relay coated malleus with a torp, because that's a heavier, more massive uh, prosthesis and it will drop into the vestibule. Alex, I just heard you say what uh, good results. Uh, I'd be very curious what our results are in revision surgery, the first re revision surgery, because mine, uh, mine are not that good. Um, whether uh, I mean, uh, I seldom use a vein graft, but um, I'd be curious if you're going to address that as well, because what do you counsel the patient with? I mean, Robert has fantastic results, although I know his results in revision are, of course, lower than primary. But wh what should we say to the patient and what are realistic uh, numbers? So what, what I say to the patients typically is that um, the uh, revision have higher risks, um, but um, uh, the technique that is used in Zurich um, goes back to um, the uh, examinations and, um, and uh, um, that uh, the um, technique that is used by, was used by Hugo Fisch. And the idea is that in revision cases, um, typically, if it's not only a loose prosthesis, we do a malleostepidotomy. And um, uh, using this, the reason for using this is actually because there are a lot of problems related to, ink, to the incus, a lot of problem related to 
ankylosis, um, even partial ankylosis. And um, interestingly, uh, the results, when you look at the results um, using the malleus stapedotomy are almost as good as um, primary stapy surgery. It's about the 5 dB difference at the end. Yeah, Dr. Alex, I have a very interesting question. I would say this is the question of the day before we can end. Uh, it's a question saying that in view of the coronavirus, how safe is it to do a stapy surgery or a revision stapy surgery as of today? Um, well, yeah, that's use a good drill. question. <laughs> I don't, I don't see, I don't see a problem in doing this. I'm restarting surgery since uh, last Monday, and uh, I, I don't think there is any uh, much risk as before. It's different when you do mass. So I think that. No. So it's certainly not yeah, an it, urgent kind of surgery. So um, most likely can be deferred to, uh, to, to a time when it is safe. And that depends obviously on the country um, figures uh, or even the local figures. And um, if there is like a, a lockdown situation, I would um, not advise to do a AP surgery um, and, and just wait until this is over. You know, it's not, it's not the stapy surgery that is at risk. It, it's the intubation. It's the anesthesia that puts the entire room at risk. Yes. And so uh, that's, that's really the issue. And so uh, for, for us, I haven't done uh, surgery for two months now. And uh, when we start, what they're going to do is uh, they're going to COVID test every patient within 24 to 48 hours prior to surgeries so that we're sure that um, there's no risk. That's what we do. That's what we, we do, do in Zurich now. Just to clarify, in, in Italy, the situation, of course, was terrible. But the problem in your surgery was the, the mastoidectomy. Because uh, yeah. when you're performing mastoidectomy, you have the aerosolization of the patients. And so it's more high-risk procedure. But uh, for stapler surgery, it's not a problem. Also for a middle-year surgery, like uh, tympanic cavity surgery. So the problem in the ear surgery is uh, drilling the mastoid. So it's just to clarify the situation. Nowadays, we are restart all the, our ear activity, of course, with the protection. But uh, uh, the real problem was uh, the mastoidectomy, high-risk procedure. High risk for the surgeon, that is. So you need to be young and a female, and then you're, not, you're OK. <laughs> But it's, it's an interesting question at that moment. It's interesting to share that kind of uh, decision. So I can see that, uh, Neil, that you have still, uh, you don't do it in New York. But I guess it's not the same in it, depending on the place in the US, right? Because you don't have, same in France, in Italy. You didn't have the same problems depending on the situation. In New York, in the, in the south of or middle America was not the same, right? It is very difficult to get people, uh, surgeons, but everybody really to cooperate for a long time when there's no cases in their community. In New York, there were many cases. And so it's not difficult to convince us that we need to stay home. But uh, unfortunately, Americans are getting very restless and uh, they want to go out. <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? I think we have I another so. 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. You have a lot of time. 30 minutes. That's fine. You've oh, got, of, you got more than 30 minutes. Yeah. Ah, okay. There's a nice that's, question that's here. True, John. That what common cause and site of incus necrosis? Because so much has been said. What is, according to everyone, is the most common cause of necrosis? Is it uh, too tight a piston or briefly nobody knows? Still under discussion. <laughs> yeah, I think there is a... Alex? I don't think we have an answer for that. We don't have an answer, do we? Um, but we have some, could we be have some knowledge solution. about it. Alex has an answer. Yes. I, I don't have an answer, but I just have some background. So um, so the, the question is, what what does lead to an incus necrosis? Um, is, it, uh, is it the lenticular pro process that has not enough uh, blood supply, for example? Um, that, that is certainly one... Um, one possible cause. And um, we know that most of the blood supply comes through the core of the incus, uh, through the long process of the incus. But this is not true in all cases. Um, 
apparently in some cases also the mucosa, the periosteal, uh, per mucosal periosteal layer also uh, gives some blood supply. Um, so this is this is one part. The other part is that um, if there is a um, if there is a prosthesis which is relatively loose, this um, this can lead to uh, to a movement between the prosthesis and the incus, which leads to um, resorption of some of the bone of uh, under the incus. But what at the end, um, the reason is for all the incus necrosis, I, I also don't have an answer. Can I say something, Alex? Uh, it's interesting, but I think we make it, need to make a, a decision or a division between necrosis and erosion. And I think in surgery we see the difference. Sometimes you do sur mm -hmm. surgery and you see the piston is delodged de and the, the ink is, is, uh, is, is shortened. I think that's a typical case that where uh, necrosis is likely because the whole uh, ink has a long process has uh, gone away. If you have, you frequently we see that you see the intact incus, but the, 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 but the prosthesis has semi come loose. I mean, there's a thinning of the incus where the, the prosthesis is fixed. I think those are typical cases where it's more likely to be erosion. And of course, the cause of an erosion is not vascular, I don't think vascular, but it's more mechanical wear and tear. And the, the other uh, argumentation would be uh, probably vascular, like you said. Mm -hmm. And I, um, if it's possible, I would like to, to have, I have a question, of course. I have a question. Uh, in my experience, sometimes, um, of course, I receive a lot of patients from different institutions and in order to perform a revision surgery. And sometimes the problem that the, the, the surgeon was not able to see in a good way or there was adhesions of the facial nerve. And so he tried to put a prosthesis with the failure. So when uh, we uh, performing the second procedure or the revision surgery, we, we found that these uh, deshens of the facial nerve. And uh, what, what about uh, this situation? Do you have an experience uh, in your opinion? It's better to go on and so trying to put uh, the prosthesis performing drilling or you suggest that the patient, okay, uh, this is a dangerous situation, it's better to to avoid the surgery. Are you are you saying are you talking about the case of where you have adherence between the shaft of the process, for example, and the facial nerve, which is the ASIN, right? Yes. So in that I've seen cases like this, of course, and I mean it, there's not much problem of a problem with that. What I do, I I don't use the laser, of course, in this case, but that would be uh, too dangerous. So I use a very very small hook, uh, micro hook, and I go, uh, you know. I try to find a cleavage plane or create a kind of cleavage plane between the shaft of the prosthesis and the facial nerve. And I'm, what I'm doing is that I'm following the shaft itself by contact. You know, I, I stay with the hook in contact with the shaft of the prosthesis and moving from um, to the up to the superior part of the, of the shaft, up to the loop, progressively like this. And in, in, in many of cases, there is no problem to do by, by doing this. So, and then you can remove the prosthesis only when you have, of course, uh, released the adherence like this. And then you can perform the, the stapedotomy by sometimes enlarging the drill <coughs> to the promontory. Uh, if you need some again, this is usually less of a problem with Teflon. Teflon will normally slide out, but uh, other materials can present a problem. Yeah, but even with the titanium prosthesis, you can do that. If you stay in contact with the shaft of the prosthesis itself, always in contact, you have, you have to fill it, and then you can, you can do it safely, progressively, like this. You know? but, but, but Robert, I think you need to advise in a general sense, and I think uh, not everybody is manually capable of doing it like you do, so maybe the general advice may be something different. I mean, I would not be opposed to say that it can be wise if you see a, a difficult situation like that, it can be wise to say, okay, I leave it to a more experienced surgeon. Close the ear, there's always another day. There's, this is cold surgery, you know, we all admit that. Why put the patient at risk? If, if you're junior, you haven't done many, there's not somebody there to help you, just close up. It's much better than having months and months of depression yourself about a failure and much worse for the patient. 
it was clear from the discussion yesterday that if any complication, the, the major complication is of course a facial nerve paralysis. And even the hearing, I mean, hearing is less, I mean, it's a terrible, horrible if it happens, but hearing is less, considered less traumatic than a facial uh, palsy permanent. So I, I, I think you should prioritize the uh, risk and make that your uh, essential part of your treatment and avoid, avoid doing that. Yeah? Well, there's a, there is an interesting uh, uh, point here. Uh, when we talk about reobliteration of the oval window, uh, there are reports of two types of reobliteration. One is a bony obliteration and one is a fibrous covering over the fenestra, which sometimes can be uh, dangerous because it has can have adhesions inside the inner ear. And in the process of trying to remove them, you can cause some amount of sensory neural loss. So have any of you experienced such uh, uh, an issue when you have a fibrous uh, uh, obliteration, which cannot be really that easy? Well, Minish, that's why we were talking about the, the distal tip of the prosthesis and absolutely controlling what you're doing with it. We, we covered probably about 15 minutes ago talking about using the laser on a very low power to visualize that area because there's a definite uh, risk that maybe the saccule may be attached. So you, you're making a good point there. You have to be very careful. Yes. So would a, would a vein graft actually avoid such a position? I don't think so. It's not really. But you know what? You know what, Manesh? It's an interesting question. I know Daniel wants to say something. But uh, uh, in my experience, if, if I compare the risk of having a bony obliterated foot plate, which is uh, not that frequent, this is higher risk compared to uh, fibrous tissue. Because when you drill out a bony foot plate, there's a high risk of central hearing loss because you heat the labyrinth. There's a higher risk of heating the labyrinth. And the case that I had of central hearing loss following uh, re they were all related to, not all, but the majority were related to bony foot plates. So it's, I think it's more uh, dangerous. I don't know, Daniel, you wanted to say something? No, uh, I agree totally. This is the point. Uh, when you uh, we are when you have to drill uh, a, a large reobliteration, of course, uh, this is the most high dangerous uh, situation. And uh, also, as before, I, I stress the concept that most important aspect is to understand the projections of the fundus of the internal auditory canal because one of my colleagues. Uh, performing the drilling, he put uh, the drill inside the fundus. And the most anterior you are, and the most dangerous, uh, you, uh, you are in the most dangerous situation. So it's very important. Would anyone like to add to that? Well, one, one honest question from me to everybody. It's a really honest question. Uh, how many of you have actually referred or advised a patient to hearing aid instead of a revision surgery? The Frequently, <laughs> of course. I, I want to honest answer. It's 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 it's, it's, it's difficult to say that, Minesh. It's a really a case by case discussion. I, I don't know. It's not very. That's a diplomatic reply. <laughs> no, no, no. Really, uh, no. even if the French sometimes can be diplomatic. But okay, it's, let me let me frame it. Let me frame it differently. In which cases would you actually give a, a patient an option for a hearing aid when it comes for a revision case? All of them. Always. Always. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sure. I agree to that. I think we need to discuss with the patient um, the hearing aid. And if we are not absolutely convinced that the patient uh, prefers surgery, then we should uh, ask him to go and try one out. There's no risk with that. And then they'll come back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you've, you've but you've still given them the choice. But if you see a patient coming to you Absolutely. for a revision with a fantastic cochlear reserve, uh, you know, 0 dB, don't, don't. 5 dB, it's and a big law. air bone gap. I know, it, Wilco, we all, offer them, we all offer them a hearing aid. We definitely do. No, no. But the, but, law, say, the law says that you explain yeah. to the patient what the disease is and what the yes. alternative yeah. treatment possibilities are. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. The, and the risks associated with it. With a hearing yeah, aid, but, it's maybe uh, allergy for the device, but of course, many luckily choose for a uh, revision surgery, which is good. But we all know that our results of revision surgery are not as good as primary surgery. But your advice with a patient with a poor cochlear reserve for revision would probably be different to your advice 
to a patient with a very good cochlear reserve. Is that true, or am I confusing no, you, the issue? No, well, you're probably confusing it, John, but, but it is true, because <laughs> uh, you try to be as personalized in your advice, yes. as being, being multifactorial, seeing uh, this is a compliant patient, they understand what you're saying, etc., etc., and you adjust your language and your uh, your 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 uh, your expansion on the on the matter to, as much as you know that the patient can understand and you don't overload them. But you do need to show or tell them all the options available and the advantages and disadvantages, and that all in 15 minutes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. But I also think that our duty is as a doctor to give them the what we would uh, prefer for them. I think it's our duty to, 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 to um, orientate them to the best decision for them by ex after explaining everything, of course. Yes, but, but what I'm I trying certainly, to I, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, if the patient has been operated and has ha is having a sensory neural component, perhaps which is slightly increasing over the period of time, and you know you might operate him and give him a, actually a dead ear and you don't want to fall into a, a, a puddle trap and you advise him a hearing aid and wait and hope for the best. And is that really an option which one should think of in this era? Sure. Well, yes, Manish, that's what I was saying about the cochlear reserve. If, there's a, if there is a sensory neural hearing loss, you are going to probably shy in favor of holding back and trying all different sorts of hearing aids. You wouldn't go plowing straight in. If you've got a patient who had a stapes done a year ago and suddenly the hearing got worse, but there's a very good cochlear threshold, it's more likely the prosthesis has come off or something you can do about it. And therefore you counsel them according to that, according to what Wilco is saying. Yes, yes, yes. Thank and, you, John. We agree. Nice question. Uh, yes. Uh, in my opinion, uh, of course, uh, it's clear that if you have... Uh, a good uh, bone reserve gap uh, is the best. But anyway, I I would like to stress that it's really important uh, to uh, to give uh, the two options for the patients and explaining that anyway uh, the revision surgery it's of course a little bit dangerous because some complication can happen. So when everything is clear we can uh, decide in a in a honest way uh, the the approach for the patient over the traditional prosthesis or a uh, revision surgery of course depending of also of the age of the patient because the young patient they want to, to uh, undergo to, to revision surgery of course but anyway it's really important to uh, to explain the two options in my opinion and Danny, uh, Danny, I agree with you fully but what percentage of uh, hearing or airborne gap within 10 dB would you quote to your patient for revision uh, at least 30 30 dB gap of gap because uh, uh, sometimes in, in my hands, when uh, you have less than 20 dB of gap, uh, at the end, uh, uh, it's really frustrating for the surgeon and for the patient because the results is different. It's no, really I, difficult. I agree, but I, I asked, what do, you, what do you tell your patient? I think after my revision surgery with you, uh, you have a 60% chance that your hearing will become within 10 dB airborne gap, or what percentage do you tell the patient? No, I, I'm just uh, uh, to explain to the patient that in all the revision surgery, in all literature, uh, the possibility to lose completely the hearing function in, in this year, it's about between 1% and 2% of the cases. After, after this. Can I maybe Perhaps, just um, bring in the Zoom room here? The Zoom room, one of the guys are asking that if we had to now do a poll of the uh, panel, who would you've operated the primary surgery on this patient? They maybe two, three years later. Let's just put it at a 30 year old patient. Two, three years later, they've got a hearing loss again. You go back, it was an incus erosion, let's say, for example, you repaired it. And now, four years down the line, the patient comes and again, there's a large airborne gap. Not knowing anything else, who would recommend? So, this would be in our third time sur stapy surgery. Who would recommend rather, and you were the main surgeon in all the cases, who would recommend by show of hands? 
a hearing aid would be recommended here, or you would actually recommend, uh, well, put up your put up your right hand if you think you would rather give the patient or recommend a hearing aid. Just they just want a poll from all of us there. Anybody recommend a hearing aid? Okay, so Wilco's going with the hearing aid. And so the rest of us will say we're willing to open that ear for a fourth time. Is that right? It, uh, Dwayne, I think it would be wiser to refer to an other expert colleague. If you were the surgeon the previous times, I don't think it's, uh, well, unless it's a special case, it doesn't make sense, much sense. And the statistics, I think that's I a, mean, the, the statistics are quite disturbing. Of course, it's a front surgery, that apart, apart from that. Yeah. But your results for a third time revision are not very good. I can get, yeah. I'm sure yours aren't either. Mine aren't, definitely. Mine aren't, and I agree totally with you. I think that's an excellent answer. I think I would suck up my pride and refer to a senior colleague. There's one other question here that they're asking that I think does play a little bit of an important role here is how do we manage that short-term sort of, uh, or what is the process of why we get that short-term uh, disequilibrium sort of from day two, three onwards, where initially the patients are discharged from the hospital, everything seems to be going well, and then they get this disequilibrium. Two or three questions came in on that. Any answers from the panel? That one worries well, me. Um, uh, unsteadiness and vertigo at day three or four, I'm very wary of. We give them quite a lot of steroid um, during the operation. We give them granisetron or ondansetron, depending on what's available. They're done under a laryngeal mask and we keep them overnight. We don't do them as a day case or I don't do them as a day case. They're normally okay when they go home the next day, but um, I don't know what Robert and the others feel, but if I get somebody who rings up and says, I've got disequilibrium at day three or four, or I, I quite often see them. Yeah, I it ruins That's the that. evening, John. It ruins the evening when you get a phone call, phone call like that. <laughs> no, but I think it's, it's uh, the, the, the type of vertigo or dizziness that we have post operative depend on the, uh, the severity depends on the timing. Uh, with experience uh, with my patient, if I have patient having vertigo or some dizziness immediately post-op, usually it's not that important. It's a mechanical reaction, which is uh, not very important. But uh, when they complain for delayed vertigo, that's uh, more tricky. Yeah. Of course, you have them in for a week, Robert, and you give them a French kiss every day, so they feel very well looked after anyway. So not you can anymore. keep a very not close anymore. eye on them. <laughs> not any more French kiss. Not any more French kiss. But, but John, <laughs> if you tell your patient that you're going to do a French kiss, they'll all leave the same day. It's all daycare. <laughs> <laughs> Just Does ask you guys. Another I've question. Got you, another I've question got two patients. Zoom room. Right, Who okay. would operate if you have if you do a first stapes and you get a significant sensory neural loss? Who of the panel would operate on the second ear, which is now obviously the better hearing ear? No. Most no. likely nobody. We're, but we need you to know a little bit more about the the moment of onset of the central neural hearing loss. If it's directly uh, following the surgery. Uh, that definitely makes a surgical procedure more likely, I think, or infection. And, um, and the other can still be cochlear or so. You know? But I, I wouldn't touch it either, no, single-sided. I would send them to Robert. There's can also I just a question ask you guys, whether, whether, whether well, I've got you there. Can I just ask? Yeah. Can I just ask while I've got you there? We'll do the question from the Zoom room as well. I've got two patients with um, fistulas. And, and I would like to spend just two minutes with you guys discussing your management of a fistula once Ian's put his question. No, I've done that. Yes, there, okay, so you get the... Can I, can I ask it? John, you're making it difficult. I need to switch left, right, front, forward. Make your question, please. <laughs> you're in screen. Go with your question. I'm juggling here. Come on. Me? All right, okay. I've got your two job. patients. Both with, both with uh, symptoms highly suggestive of fistulae, um, they're not my patients, they're, they're patients I've been asked about, um, and they're looking for advice. Um, I would like to know from the panel how they manage uh, a potential fistula coming on months after surgery. Uh, without a vein graft, I would re uh, do a re-intervention because I think the ear is at risk. 
Right. But I, I mean, if you have a fistula, there's clearly a, a indication for revision. Uh, we always, of course, it, it depends on several factors, including, of course, the hearing. But uh, if it's only one month and if it's a typical fistula sign, you can wait a little bit. I would say one month more, but the, the patient really is having a lot of... Uh, is having bad time. So you have to make a decision for revision. There's no problems for me to make the decision. Of course, the, the so if somebody fine, says so they'll, if somebody says they'll inject a, a little bit of blood to see if that works, do you no. think that that's reasonable? No, no, inject think, where, John? Into yeah, the ear. You, you, it goes everywhere. It goes everywhere. So I don't think it's going to solve that. Okay. John, I think the, what risk, about, the, the, the risk would be introducing infection even. So I would... Uh, uh, try to cure the leakage. I mean, if you're pretty sure that it's there, I think you, you can't wait to intervene. And your primary goal is to stop it. And the secondary goal is to make sure that you don't introduce an infection. Can, can we ask to all the panelists, maybe for the, this question like this, would you be all, do you agree, all of you, to do revision surgery if you have a patient with a normal hearing, good result, and fistula sign after one month? Yes. Everybody would do. So, John, you have yes. your answer. It's what you do that was the answer. Uh, you know, I have another patient where somebody wrapped a piece of vein graft around the prosthesis to try and produce a seal, and it hasn't worked. Um, and I, I mean, I personally believe that you need to take the prosthesis out um, and then put some kind of material over the stapedotomy. You know, I use vein, but it could be tragal perichondrium, but I, I'd be interested if anybody else has any brilliant ideas. No, I, I think you didn't listen to my presentation then, John. I was presenting this case at the last, uh, uh, the last one. Uh, that's important to point out the fact that you need to, yeah. to uh, expose the fistula in order to seal it. Once you expose the fistula, yes. you will be able to, to, to seal it. If you do not expose yeah. the fistula clearly, you're not going to solve it. So it's important to remove the prosthesis, remove the previous uh, tissue which was uh, uh, used or vaporizing yeah. it, and then seal it nicely with a uh, with another tissue. Yeah, Robert, I, I did have, understand that, Robert, but I, I promised I promised Sorry, I would no. ask the question. I promised yeah. the two patients I would ask okay. the question. That's why I've brought it up again. Okay. Uh, but but it's interesting. I, I wonder whether there's a difference if there, if you use the vein graft or not, because. To, to be honest, I would use probably fat with some vibrant glue and leave the prosthesis in place. Alex, what would you do? I would uh, I would revise. Um, I would take the prosthesis out and and seal it. So, uh, in my my opinion, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's important to cover with some material, and uh, if you want to use vein or uh, fat. Uh, fascia is not uh, really important but the most important is is to see where is the fistula and uh, sometimes the fistula is because uh, the the oval window and the foot plans was uh, was broken so uh, sometimes you have to convert your technique in, in a total stapedectomy and put uh, uh, the graft. So another important aspect of the fistula, depending of the position of the fistula and depending of the condition of the foot plates, I think. Agreed. Yeah. Another, another so I think we the, have uh, another, um, I, I another think we, um, we should, can, uh, I'm not sure if we have time. We have three more, three more minutes and um, I would okay. suggest that um, I try to wrap up and um, and I made some, some notes, what I think was um, agreed on by the panel. Now, first, I, um, I have some revision state. Do, do you, did you have it on your slides, or do you want or not want to use I, the I slides think, at all? I think the slide, the slide is, not, um, is not up to date anymore. So I, I, <laughs> I just read it, and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we can see if everybody agrees to that. So um, revision state piece surgery is technically very demanding. I think we all agree to that and maybe associate with higher risk than primary surgery. Um, we thought that exposure um, during surgery is most important and thereby it's uh, very important to um, uh, do a canaloplasty to take off the rim and, and see what's happening. Most of the panelists would uh, do the surgery on the general anesthesia and uh, do not feel that it's necessary to get response of the patients during surgery. Um, when there is an obliteration of the oval window, 
um, everybody feels or most of the panel feels that we need wide drilling for different reasons. And um, also uh, the technique uh, used for revisions need to be adapted to the pathology and the surgeons need to have uh, different um, techniques available in their armamentarium to uh, help the patient. Then further, um, laser seems to be mandatory in uh, revision surgery. Um, if, uh, particularly if we uh, remove um, the piston tip, we need to see the tip and use a laser. Um, we don't use a laser when there is a connection of the prosthesis to the facial nerve, of course. And um, um, if there is a risk for the facial nerve, uh, consider closing the ear and uh, refer the patient to somebody else. Offer hearing aid to patients before performing revision surgery. And um, if there is a fistula, revision um, is mandatory and exposure of the fistula seems important. Does uh, everybody agree to that or do we have to? I, I missed the first thing. Can you repeat it again, Alex? No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's a perfect, perfect summary. <laughs> no, you were awake. Very well. No, I, th I think it went very well. Uh, I, I think because uh, we're absolutely dead on, on time, so we need to ra wrap it up. Alex, from the studio in Utrecht, I want to thank you and all the panelists. I need to thank, of course, Robert and all the others, but especially uh, Manesh, who was running the uh, the crowd, like uh, herd herding them and uh, doing all the polls. Very interesting, all kinds of questions coming through. Uh, we're uh, now taking a break and to have our sponsors, which are Grace Medical, but also uh, Luminous and Courts which are very related to, to the field. I have them uh, 15 minutes and we'll be back with the next topic. Hope to see you soon. Thank you all and bye-bye. Uh,